Well, good morning. If, uh, thank you. Good morning and welcome to Kansas State University. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Rich Linton, president of Kansas State University and... I'm Sally Linton, first lady here at K-State. So you might be wondering why, why both of us are on the stage here today. Today's a big day. Uh, we've got the Landon Lecture, we've got the Health Promoting University announcement that we're going to be making, and there's a real connection between the passion of our governor and what we're trying to do with the Health Promoting University, which Sally is a part of leading. And so I thought, why not have her involved in the introduction, and it cuts my, half, my uh, workload by half, <laughs> which is what's really important. Um, it is an honor for us to be able to welcome all of you to campus as we celebrate Kansas State's 161st birthday. And I think you would agree with me that um, we have aged rather well. And I know that when it's my birthday, I like to be sung to. So I'm gonna start this off in a little different way I'm going to ask all of you to stand. And yes, we are going to sing happy birthday to Kansas State University. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Kansas State University. Happy birthday to you. Today we commemorate the history of not only K-State, but the Landon Lecture Series. Landon Lectures began in 1966 by then K-State President James McCain as a tribute to Alfred M. Landon. I know what you're thinking, there's that crazy president again. <laughs> For those who are not familiar with Alf Landon, let me highlight a few of the many influences he made during his outstanding career. Serving as the 26th governor of Kansas during the Great Depression, he served as a significant political figure nationally, even being nominated as the Republican Party's presidential candidate in 1936. His advocacy spanned crucial society reforms that included women's suffrage, infrastructure enhancement, antitrust measures, child labor prohibition, and alleviating the economic hardships that were so important to that era. Alfred Landon stood by the marginalized, embodying the essence of strong and empathetic leadership that was essential in confronting the pressing challenges of his time. This lecture series has been championed by Nancy Landon Casabom Baker, a trailblazing Kansan and former U.S. Senator from the Sunflower State and daughter of Alf Landon. She made history as the first ever woman elected to the Senate from Kansas. During her tenure, she actively participated in key committees, such as the Committee on Foreign Relations and the Committee on Labor and Human Resources. Senator Kassebaum was recognized for her bipartisan approach, earning respect from colleagues on both sides of the political spectrum. Her dedicated commitment to public service and her ability to collaborate across party lines marked her influential tenure. Remaining a highly regarded figure in Kansas politics, Senator Kassebaum continues to be a pioneer for women in government, 
leaving an enduring legacy that inspires future generations of leaders. Before we introduce our speaker for today's Landon Lecture, I would like to recognize a few individuals that are in attendance today. Please stand as you're being recognized as we call your name, and please, uh, for the rest of you, hold your applause until the end. From Kansas State University, Dr. Debbie Mercer, the Interim Pro Executive Vice President and Provost. Now you're supposed to hold those applause until the end. Let's try that again. <laughs> Dr. Debbie Mercer, Interim Provost and Executive Vice President, and she's also a K-State alumnus. Dr. Marshall, thank you. Dr. Marshall Stewart, Senior Vice President, Chief of Staff, and Chair of the Landon Lecture Series. Dr. Don Von Bergen, President of the Faculty Senate from our Salina campus. Regina Crowell, President of the University Support Staff. Caleb Stout, student body president and senior in agricultural economics. Jessica Binkley, student body vice president and senior in psychology and pre-medicine. And Courtney Van Ness, graduate student council president and graduate student in public health. Let's give them all a big round of applause. We would also like to take a moment to recognize our distinguished guests. And the same process holds true. <laughs> Let's see how we do. David Tolan, Kansas Lieutenant Governor and Secretary of Commerce. Mike Beam, Kansas Secretary of Agriculture and K-State alumnus. Usha Reddy, Kansas Senator and Kansas State alumnus. There's a lot of Kansas State alumnus here. Sydney Carlin, Kansas representative and K-State alumnus. Mike Dotson, Kansas representative and Kansas State alumnus. Dr. Blake Flanders, Kansas Board of Regents president and CEO and Kansas State alumnus. Carl Ice, Kansas Board of Regent and a member and a Kansas State alumnus. Dr. Cynthia Lane, Kansas Board of Regents member and K-State alumnus. We should just said everyone's a Kansas State alumnus and just gone on. <laughs> Dr. Susan Adamchak, Manhattan City Commissioner and Mayor Pro Tem. John Ford, Raleigh County Commissioner and Kansas State alumnus. And Alicia Johnson, Kansas Board of Regent member and K-State alumnus. Let's give them all a big <laughs> round of applause. Across the years, Landon Lectures have touched on matters important to the university, the state, and beyond. As the next generation land-grant university supporting the health and well-being of those here on campus as well as across the state is incredibly important. In doing so, we can do incredible things for one another in having the critical conversations that impact our state, our nation, and our world. And that is truly what the Landon Lecture Series is all about. So today we honor the 26th governor of Kansas legacy by having our now 48th governor join us. Governor Laura Kelly has dedicated her career to advocating for children and families. As governor, she has collaborated with both political parties to achieve a balanced state budget, secure funding for schools, address the state's infrastructure needs, reform the child welfare system, and achieve record-breaking business investment and job creation. Kelly concluded her first term with the largest budget surplus in state history while reducing taxes for working families. Now in her second term as governor, Kelly continues her efforts to make Kansas the premier place in the country to raise a family. Her focus areas include expanding accessible health care, supporting early childhood development, ensuring prosperity 
that reaches every corner of the state. Today, her lecture will focus on ways we can create a culture that contributes to bettering our people, our places, and our planet. It truly could not be a more perfect time to have the governor join us and share her insights at K-State. So now it's time. Please help me in welcoming, give a big uh, K-State family welcome to Governor Laura Kelly and invite her to the podium. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, President Linton, for that introduction and for inviting me here today. I'm delighted to be with all of you, especially on Founders Day. You know, before I begin, I do need to acknowledge the tragedy that took place uh, just two days ago in Kansas City. Uh, this senseless violence took a Kansan's life. Upwards of a dozen children were injured and countless thousands more scarred and horrified. The prevalence of gun violence has invaded our schools, our campuses, our entertainment venues, our workplaces, and our homes. I look forward to the day when we can have open, honest discussions about the causes and work towards a safer society for all of us. I am humbled today to join the ranks of esteemed public servants who have participated in this series over the years and honored to be the first sitting Kansas governor to present a Landon lecture since Alf Landon himself did so in 1966. I'm also honored to be the first ever sitting female governor to do so. And I know I won't be the last. You know, everyone who has stood on this stage owes a debt of gratitude to former K-State President James McCain, who initiated this series as a tribute to Governor Landon. We also owe a debt of gratitude to his daughter, Nancy Landon Cassebaum, who dedicated her career to serving the people of Kansas and who has been a great role model for me and for so many others. For those who may not know Nancy Landon of Cassabell, she became the first woman to represent Kansas in the U.S. Senate when she was elected in 1978, and the first woman ever to be elected whose husband had not previously served in government. She was also the only woman in the Senate at that time. In fact, early in her first term, Senator Cassabell had to wait in line with the tourists at the Capitol to use a bathroom, while the male senators had exclusive use of a private lounge. And while her father, Alf Landon, did many great things for our state and our country, he made at least one serious miscalculation. He discouraged his daughter from running for the Senate seat in 1978 because, he said, Kansas wasn't ready to elect a woman. Fortunately for Kansas, Nancy ignored him. <laughs> you know, though Senator Cassebaum was and still is a proud Republican, she became known for working across the aisle with her colleagues, like when she teamed up with Ted Kennedy to pass a landmark health care privacy bill. A few years ago, Senator Cassebaum told me she was convinced she could not be elected today precisely because of her willingness to work with the other party. It deeply concerns me that the brand of bipartisan politics practiced by Senator Kassebaum has eroded, and it should concern you too, because these types of unlikely partnerships are essential in government to truly make a difference in people's lives. Now here at K-State, 
I know all of you have a new initiative to make this campus healthier. Just as at the state level, we're focused on making our communities healthier by investing in things like mental health, water quality, and safer roads. But the longer I'm in this job, the more I've come to believe that if we truly want to build a healthier future for Kansas, we need to start by making our political discourse healthier, or at the very least, less toxic. Let's do a little pop quiz here. By a show of hands, over the past few years, how many of you have seen friendships go by the wayside because of political disagreements? Okay, there's no right, right or wrong answer here. <laughs> now, how many of you have had a Thanksgiving dinner ruined by heated arguments <laughs> over Thanksgiving? <laughs> and now, be honest with yourselves. How many of you feel that someone's political views reflect whether they're a good or a bad person? Our politics today is tearing us apart. Our friendships, our families, our communities, and our nation. It wasn't supposed to be this way. We expect disagreement in politics. That's a good thing. But the idea was that people with differing beliefs would come together to find shared values, common priorities, and the greater good. But that's obviously not happening much anymore. So what on earth happened? And more importantly, how do we dig our way back to a healthier politics? That's what I'm gonna be speaking about here today. <laughs> that was not an applause line, but. Uh, <laughs> I first ran for public office in 2004, 20 years ago. In politics, that's an entire lifetime, and I suspect that for many of you students here, that's literally a lifetime ago. <laughs> so for those of you who weren't around then, here's what the world looked like in 2004. The social network that was then known as the Facebook was still available only on college campuses. Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok did not exist. Local reporters covered the state house, city halls, and school board meetings. When I was in the state senate, a slew of reporters camped out at the Capitol, ready with eyes, ears, and notebooks open, ready to tell their readers and viewers what was going on. Now, with their ranks thinned significantly, much of what happens goes unreported. In 2004, there were 21 governors who represented states that voted for the other party for president. 13 Democratic governors in red states, eight Republican governors in blue states. But in 2022, just 18 years later, there was an, only one Democratic governor who won a state that went for Donald Trump in the previous election. And you are looking at her. <laughs> Over the past 20 years, our politics has become not just polarized, but nationalized. Now you see campaigns for state representative or city council being focused on the same issues you see on national cable news, issues that have little or nothing to do with the constituents they'll actually be serving. We saw it recently in school board races across our state, with some candidates using national talking points to attack our teachers, our librarians, our administrators, instead of discussing the issues actually impacting our classrooms in Kansas, like special education funding, mental health resources, and school safety. The same thing happened in my campaigns. Both of my opponents in 2018 and again in 2022 didn't attack me based on my record or really anything happening in Kansas. Instead, they ran ad after ad trying to convince Kansas that I'm actually Bernie Sanders in a wig. <laughs> or Joe Biden in heels. I ran my campaign on issues the governor of Kansas actually has to deal with. Balancing the budget, 
tax cuts, higher education, fixing the foster care system. It was as if my opponents and I were running for two very different offices. It's a strategy we're seeing more and more now. The campaign debates that voters hear are starting to sound the same, race after race, election after election, whether it's on the local, state, or federal level. These are the same issues they hear on cable news, on radio talk shows, and see on their social media. You know, former Speaker of the House from Massachusetts, Tip O'Neill, used to say, all politics is local. And while that's the way it should be, I'm not sure that it is the way anymore. This nationalizing of local politics carries real and serious consequences. First and foremost, voters don't hear healthy, spirited debates about the issues that their local elected officials will actually be responsible for in office. Second, when candidates aren't taking positions on those local issues, the public is then unable to hold those officials accountable once they are in office. And third, if campaigns become void of policy and substance, then the only thing voters can choose on is party and ideology. Voters get backed into partisan camps, which of course is why political parties often champion this strategy. The result is, more and more, Americans are simply voting the party line up and down the ticket. Very few voters across the country choose a candidate of one party for president and another for Senate or governor. Ticket splitters are becoming an endangered species. But that's not the reality everywhere. When Americans, and when Americans vote for a party, regardless of who the candidate is, it makes it that much easier for parties to win with extreme candidates. They no longer need to appeal to voters in the middle. Even worse, you're seeing political parties proactively purge themselves of their moderate elected officials the types who don't always vote the party line, who may actually reach across the aisle to get something done. We saw that happen here in Kansas under one of my predecessors. In 2012, there was an active campaign waged within the Kansas Republican Party to defeat the more moderate Republicans in the legislature. It was successful for all of the reasons I've discussed here today, and it's done great harm to our ability to govern for Kansans. Just look at Medicaid expansion. If legislators would expand Medicaid, 150,000 more Kansans would have access to health insurance, and we could lower health care costs for everyone else, all at no additional expense to taxpayers. In 40 other states, including many red states, this is no longer a partisan issue. These states have gone ahead and expanded Medicaid. But in Kansas, it remains an ideological battle, in part because legislative leadership doesn't want to see a Democratic governor get a win. You know, I want to say to leadership, look, guys, I'm not running again. You can pass Medicaid expansion. You can do all of the press conferences. You can take all of the credit. I'll stay behind the scenes if you like. But the idea that people aren't getting the health care they need because of petty partisan politics is just shameful. It's an example of how polarization is crushing our ability to get things done for Kansans. Imagine for a moment a football field, maybe like the one at Bill Snyder Stadium or the one in Orlando. Now, the season is over, the celebrations have ended, and all you see is a green field with yard markers. Now, most Americans, most Kansans, are ideologically positioned somewhere between the 40-yard lines. They're either a little to the left on an issue or a little to the right on an issue, and some are smack dab in the middle. However, so many of their elected officials seem to live between the 10-yard line and the end zone uh, on the extreme sides of the field. And unless you're Will Howard, it's very hard to get from one end zone all the way to the other. <laughs> so those politicians just stay in their own end zones. They can barely see the middle of the field, let alone get there. As a result, they refuse to even discuss, much less find solutions to, many of the key issues that really matter to Kansans. And not just Medicaid expansion, but on jobs, education, childcare, mental health. 
the inability or unwillingness to build consensus to find common ground prevents progress on just about everything. Now, I'm not saying that we haven't been able to get anything done here in Kansas. Of course we have. But I'll tell you, it's not because of the people who were standing in the end zones. It's because of the people who were, were willing to come to the middle of the field. An example of that is what happened in the fall of 2021. I was headed into an election year and was regularly being called all sorts of names by my opponents. My personal favorite was lying Laura, but Republicans were dead set on stopping me from winning that next November. But then we were approached by a company who wanted to invest $4 billion in Kansas. It would be the largest capital investment in the history of our state. It would create 4,000 jobs and put Kansas on the global map as one of the best places in the world to do business. In essence, a huge win for Kansas. But perhaps it would also be a huge win for me politically at a time when the Republicans were desperate to reclaim the governor's office. Now, to get this company, uh, and yes, it was Panasonic Energy, to come to Kansas, we would need to pass legislation that updated our economic development tools and make the state a more appealing place to invest in. At first, it looked nearly impossible. Working together quickly in an election year, forget about it. But because, of the, but because the economy tends not to be an ideological issue, my Republican colleagues came to the table to close the deal. The Speaker of the House, the Senate Majority Leader, and I, and my Lieutenant Governor, uh, we had many, many meetings, many late night phone calls. We even took a field trip together. For those moments, we weren't a Democratic governor and Republican leaders. We were Kansas elected officials doing right by the people we were elected to serve. And that's not the only time that we have put partisan politics aside here in Kansas. We've now come together five years in a row to fully fund our public schools. We've eliminated that. Yeah. We've eliminated the state sales tax on food, and we've balanced the, yeah. That's a good one. And we've balanced the budget year after year. But I wish I could say working together happened much more often than it actually does. From Medicaid expansion to passing a new round of responsible tax cuts, there is so much more we could get done if elected officials would meet on the 50-yard line. But look, there's more to why our national politic discourse has eroded than simply how we run our campaigns or what's happening in the Kansas legislature. In today's world, it's easier than ever for Americans and for Kansans to live in their own bubble. Smartphones and social media make it easy to create your own personal echo chamber, to surround yourself only with those who think like you do. You know, there was a time when Americans and Kansans actually came together to consume the news as communities, as a state, as a nation. The daily paper on the doorstep the nightly news on the television, everyone watched Walter Cronkite or Barbara Streisand, Walters. Now, we watched Barbara Streisand too, but uh, not for the news. Um, now, Americans often only follow news outlets that they find ideologically agreeable. That bubble of agreement that people have created for themselves can be comforting. Their own friends, personalized news, curated social media. But in my view, those bubbles we live in are not healthy for our system, nor our collective mental health. So how do we break out of them? Well, I've got a plan for that. It's a th three-step program. First, admitting you have a problem. <laughs> Recognize that you probably do, in fact, live in a bubble. Two. Be proactive about engaging people in your life who you know live outside your bubble. Some family members, some neighbors, some friends. You know, a friend of mine who teaches at George Washington University told me that he recently assigned his students to interview people in their lives with whom they disagreed the most politically. 
He asked them to listen, to take notes, to think about how they could have civil discussions, and perhaps to find a way to meet in the middle. We need more of this kind of discourse in our schools, in our communities, and certainly in our government. We don't always need to talk politics with people, but make it a point to understand where they're coming from, how their life experiences inform their worldview. And my last step is a call to action of sorts. Ask those people in your life with whom you disagree about politics to join you in, say, a service project, anything you want to do. Volunteer together at a food bank, do a church activity, visit a senior center, whatever you want to do. We need to get back to a place where people can disagree about politics, but still form a bond, still engage in community service and civic life together. Now, my three-step bubble break won't fix all of the world's problems, but it would be a start. And as I serve my second term as governor, I'm committed to doing my part to bring that civility back to our politics. Some of you may recall that in my recent re-election, I ran ads where I was literally standing in the middle of the road, freezing by them, <laughs> but standing right in the middle of the road, making the case that meeting here, right there in the middle, is how to get things done. Since then, I've started a pact called, what else, middle of the road. But unlike most PACs, which support candidates on the far left or the far right, Mine is about lifting up candidates on both sides of the political aisle who are willing to put common sense solutions above political party. For me, middle of the road wasn't just a campaign slogan. It is a governing philosophy. Building on that, I want to close with a message to the students who are here today. You young adults who might just be starting to iron out your own beliefs and values. Stay open open to new ideas, open to new perspectives, open to people who grew up differently than you did. Changing your mind, changing your mind when presented with new information and new facts doesn't make you inconsistent. It makes you thoughtful and reasonable. Each of you has the chance, in fact, the responsibility to improve our political discourse and it starts with how you interact with the people in your life every day. The good news is, for so many of you, the issues that divided your parents' generation, LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, environmental protections, aren't all that controversial for your generation. But new issues are arising that will confront your generation. Issues about technology, America's place in the world, about what democracy will look like right here at home, and as you're doing here at K-State, about how to make our world a healthier place. You'll have passionate disagreements along the way with your family, your neighbors, your classmates, but also along the way, let's ensure that cooler heads always prevail, that compromise is always a possibility, and that the middle of the road is always the road most traveled. Thank you. Well, thank you, Governor, for your insightful message today, for your leadership for all of Kansans, and for your support of higher education and for the work that we do at Kansas State University. We have some time to be able to open this up for questions for the Governor. And uh, you'll see at the base of each of the two aisles, there is a standing microphone. I would ask that if you have a question, please walk up to the microphone. And when you do, if you would please state your name. Let us know if you're a student, faculty member, 
supporter, alumni, Kansas State alumnus, <laughs> and then go ahead and state your question. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Lily Harvey. I'm a student. Um, and I just would love to hear more about how you feel about expanding Medicaid in Kansas and what you think it would mean for access to health care in our state. Well, uh, I feel very strongly about Medicaid expansion as evidenced by uh, the six times I've proposed it to the state legislature. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, you know, the, the other five times that, that I did it, I did it in my traditional, you know, meet in the middle, come up with common ground. Uh, you know, and that hasn't worked. So uh, yeah, I decided I'd take a different tack because it's, it's been made into a very political issue here in the city of Kansas because there's really no good budgetary or policy reason to not expand Medicaid. Uh, so it's just all ideology. And you know, if that's the way it is, then I'm going to have to deal with it as a political issue. And so that's why we've uh, spent uh, a lot of time this summer and fall uh, going all around the state, talking to all sorts of folks um, from a variety of sectors, faith leaders, business leaders, obviously healthcare leaders. Uh, and we have now uh, presented the sixth proposal to the legislature, and they, are, uh, they at least are going to have discussions this year, which is the first time since 2019 that they've even been willing to mention those two words. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. You know, the reason I'm so adamant about Medicaid expansion is because uh, what it would do, you know, not just for the 150,000 people who are, by and large, working Kansans. You know, these are the people working in your fast food places. They might may be working in your daycare centers or in your nursing homes. These are working folks who just don't have access to employer-based uh, health insurance. And so uh, we need to make sure that they can get that. We need to do it for them, but we also need to do it for our economy. We know that people you know, who have regular health care checkups and preventive health you know, are much more likely to be productive workers. Uh, so we need to do it for them. We need to do it for our businesses. Um, I can't think of one good reason not to do it. We certainly need to do it for our rural hospitals, uh, you know, many of which have closed uh, since we've been uh, eligible to expand Medicaid. I think we've had eight, eight hospitals and some clinics that have closed. Uh, you know, Medi Medicaid expansion would be the silver bullet, but it would give them a tool uh, to use and, and buy them some time to come up with a business model that does work. So all sorts of good reason, no good reason not to. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is David Hughes-Diaz. Um, I'm here in my last semester at K-State. Um, I've had a very unusual upbringing. Uh, conservative mostly, but uh, my main question to you is, you talk about a lot how we need to be in the middle of the road, uh, especially with now, as you said, national politics is basically what has taken over. Uh, and you've done a lot of stuff, for example, the tax cut on food, that's a right-leaning policy, as well as funding schools as more left-leaning policy. How do we manage going through this culture war? As somebody who identifies as a conservative, I have had a lot of backlash just by mentioning that I'm conservative, not even mentioning what I stand for here in the university, uh, from professors as well as classmates, as I said, without even mentioning what my, what my views are on things, how do we manage this culture war that seems to be pervasive, like infiltrating, sorry, my first language is not English, per infiltrating every aspect of our lives from school to church even, um, there's a lot of a lot of hatred in the political climate that actually is not only political it's it's to the point where it's everyday life how do we get through this because i i'm a little bit older than the normal student um and i've lived in third world countries africa central america europe and here and i've never seen this a country so polarized as it is today and in my point of view i don't really see a way out of it and i know that you are very willing to work with both sides, and I just want a fresh perspective to know how do we get out of this, because it seems that we're just so polarized at this point that as long as you say I'm left or I'm right, there's an immediate wall that goes in between the people. Well, I think, I think one of the things is uh, for you uh, to 
present yourself to people, not just as I'm conservative. I know, I understand that, uh, is, is when it comes to the talk of like, well, what are your political views? And I said, well, I'm more right-leaning, and they immediately say, oh, you're, I even called, believe it or not, I've been called a racist, just for not even saying anything, not nothing, uh, just said, oh, I'm conservative. Said, oh, you like Donald Trump? Well, probably I would vote for Donald Trump over Biden this next. Well, I think if you could try the three-step program. I have, yeah, okay. I, trust me, trust me. I, uh, like I said, I, I grew up in a, in a very left, country, uh, Guatemala. I've lived in Nigeria in the middle of a torn war where I had to evacuate in the middle of a civil war. I've lived in Spain where it was very, very left and liberal. I am open to very different types of views. I like that you are the same way. However, I do see that there's, there's no compromise at all in, in this political, uh, at all. It, for example, look at Donald Trump today and not that I agree with everything, but like I said, at this point I would vote over Biden. But just by saying that, then I'm labeled this and that and this and that. In the same way with the other, the other side, if you come and say, oh, I'm a Joe Biden voter, there's the right that starts saying, oh, you're a socialist and a communist and we should hang you for it. it, it, and, it and it doesn't seem to be just political. That's my point. It's, it really is permeating every aspect of life. It, it, well, I know your three-step solution is something that's start. But it, to me, it's, it's not. Well, and, and you have to start somewhere. You, you do, know, yeah. You're not going to solve this whole big problem uh, all at once. It's, it's going to take people like you and others uh, you know, who are willing to get beyond the, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, I'm a Biden voter, I'm a Trump voter, uh, and really try to get beyond that into more. You know, what is it, what is it that you're feeling? What, why, why are you that, feeling that way? Why do you believe that way? And try to get under the surface and see if there's something there uh, that you can relate to. We do that all, all the time in the, in the legislature. We, you know, people who are completely polarized on most all issues, but if you talk long enough, you can find one thing that you might be able to work on. So you, you can find yourself working on an issue with, with one legislator uh, where there would be nothing else you could work with her on. Uh, same thing with somebody else. So it just if you if you really are willing to talk, willing to listen, and willing to really hear, uh, I think I think you have a better shot at coming up with some things that you can talk about that would be a much more agreeable conversation. Let's go ahead. And, thank you. Let's go ahead and take our next question. Uh, um, hi, uh, my name is Justin Hardy. I am a freshman here at the school. Um, Forgive me, I'm, I'm extremely nervous. I've never been to a lecture or anything political like that um, regarding politics and anything like that. So in order to convince myself to come up here, I wanted to ask something silly. Um, so pick a number, one or two. Two. All right, that's the fun one. Is it all right if I take a selfie with you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sweet. Um, thanks, I really appreciate that for entertaining um, my whimsy, but only but. if you take it with that hat on. Oh, 100 <laughs> percent. I love these hats. All right. <laughs> My sister has a matching one, but um, I wanted to, to thank you for uh, regarding people who are in the middle. Um, I am one such person. I don't want to say that I'm in a bubble, but I probably am a bubble where I sit and wait for everything to happen before making my opinion. Um, when I got my driver's license when I turned 18, um, they ask you for your political party. Um, as soon as the question dropped, I swear I felt like everybody looked in my direction waiting for me to say, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm kind of conservative, I'm very progressive in my thinking, I'm independent. I'm, so I said I'm independent, and I think that I'm going <coughs> to say so, but um, this is kind of coincides with that last gentleman, what he was talking about. When there's no common ground to be found, how do, you, how do you compromise with someone? I know finding common ways is a good way to do it. Does it start with you stepping down and being the, the not necessarily the better person, but the person that, that reaches compromise first? You can extend the hand, but that's as far as you can go. Do you have to take their hand, or do you have to wait for them to, to express what they want before giving in? Yeah, it's, that's a really complicated question because uh, you know, compromise is not easy uh, and it's very nuanced. Uh, and 
Uh, you know, I, I can give you an example uh, from this legislative session, for instance. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get some tax cuts uh, passed through. Uh, and so I put together, uh, with some Republicans and an independent, put together a tax package um, that has a lot of really good stuff in it that almost everybody wants uh, to get passed through. Um, I was presented with uh, the other side's tax package, which essentially everything I had, and then slapped the flat tax on, which I told them I was not going to. I would never sign a flat tax. Uh, you know, that was their attempt to, to say, we, we compromised, we came to the middle. We gave, you, we gave you all of these things, and then, you know, all we want is this. That was not a compromise. That's not the way you work to compromise. By putting a poison pill out there, something you know that that person can't, can't accept, either because they know it's wrong uh, or because it's against their moral core or whatever. You, you can't do that. You have to keep digging for ways uh, that uh, you, you're not striking at a, piece, at a person's moral core, uh, but rather uh, at, you know, with conversation, discussion, different perspectives, you know, they can come around to see, see it a little bit more from your point of view. And then the end result is going to be something that not, you didn't get everything you wanted, they don't get everything they wanted, uh, and maybe not happy even with the final uh, decision, but... Uh, probably that final decision is in the best interest of most people. Thank you very much. John, we'll take it right now. While they're taking their selfie, <laughs> the next question will come from this side. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hello, my name is Emily Velasquez, and I first want to say thank you for everything that you've done. I'm a graduate student from the Master of Public Administration program here at K-State, and currently 19 other states offer the opportunity for undocumented immigrants to get a driver's license. This is a policy that will provide safer opportunities for families and increase the state's economy. I was wondering, what is your stance on this topic, and do you foresee Kansas joining these other 19 states sometime soon? No. Um... <laughs> I don't. I mean, that's, that's an issue that has come up uh, year after year after year that I've been uh, in the legislature and now as governor. Uh, and it is, it is just not something that's going to ever get traction uh, in the legislature until we start sitting down and having these conversations about comprehensive immigration reform and what we have to do in order to be able to meet the needs of the people who legally want to come over here uh, and become uh, United States citizens, uh, those people who want to come over here to work uh, temporarily, uh, in, particularly in our agricultural industry, but in others, we've got to come up with, with solutions to that. One of those solutions, of course, would be uh, that you know, while they're going through uh, the, the process, uh, that you know, they need a driver's license just to be able to go to work and contribute to the economy. So, when, once we can get uh, the larger conversation going at, on a meaningful path, then I think we can deal with some of those very specific things. You know, if it were presented, uh, you know, if, if by chance uh, it got through the legislature, I would certainly sign it because I think it's important. Um, I've been in Dodge City and Liberal and other places where I, I know that uh, the ability to legally drive is important. Uh, and it's important to those, those towns, too, because they need those folks uh, working and contributing to their tax base. Thank you. Hello, Governor Kelly. My name is Jamie Pemberton, and I'm a student here. Um, the ACLU is currently tracking 15 anti-LGBTQ bills that are in Kansas. This is among the 400-plus nationwide, and that is also not including House Bill 2460, which is um, attempting to get rid of some DEI within post-secondary institutions like K-State. Um, I know that you've been a voice vetoing certain bills like this, and whether or not the legislature will um, continue to override those vetoes is something that we have yet to see, but um, how do you see us moving forward in a way that won't take away rights from certain people while we're in this national polarization? 
you know, right now, um, you know, we have we have super majorities in both our House and in our Senate. Uh, so, I have vetoed a number of anti-LGBTQ bills. Vetoed a lot of other bills too, but and some of them I've been able to sustain because I've had uh, some folks uh, from the other party come over and and um, vote to, to sustain. Uh, we honestly just need more people in the legislature uh, who uh, support uh, those causes, who believe in uh, human rights, equal rights for all people, whether they're women, LGBTQ, um, black, white. We just, we just need more people who believe uh, in fairness and freedom and equal rights for all. And while I have the chance, I'm about to go to a class on um, women's rights. Um, I feel like I have to ask for the selfie as well. <laughs> Thank you. Governor, you know, I feel like we ought to just take a picture of you and the entire audience behind you, and that'll shut down some yeah, of this. I'm Gonna guess I am the first Landon lecturer to ever take selfies. <laughs> I can guarantee that. It shows how much you're loved at Kansas State University. Our next question. Good morning. Your selfie safe from me. I'm too old for that. Okay. My name is Carla Hagemeister, and I'm an alumni. I'm a current student in the graduate school at the Kansas or at Staley School of Leadership for nonprofit leadership certificate and the director of the Flint Hills Bread Basket here in Manhattan, and a member of our USD 383 Board of Education. So, I, I, have one of those. I gave one I to you. I have one. I know. Yeah. Um, so I tried to think of a question that could encompass all of that, and it comes down to food security. At our district here in Manhattan Ogden this year, we had an increase of, I wanna say, close to 400 students who qualified for free and reduced lunch. We had a very large increase in the numbers that qualified for that service. We know that right now there's a house bill to um, turn down summer EBT benefits for our families. I know that at the breadbasket, we're serving over 65 families a day. Um, Cat's Cupboard, is serving a large number of students every day. And our families are uh, struggling. They're struggling significantly. The axing the food tax obviously supports all Kansans, not just families who are struggling with food insecurity. But as I look at the sustainability and, and what we're doing here at the local level and what's happening in districts, school districts, um, and other places all across the state, uh, we're the we're the stopgap. We're the thing that's 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 pulling people out of the river. Um, what can we do? How can we support families? How can we advocate or impact change in Topeka and elsewhere so that our families are not being tossed into the river in the first place? What can we do to make those impact changes at that higher level so that that less families need us or that we can be more sustainable and have the resources that we need to support our families? Well, uh, specifically on the SNAP benefits, the summer SNAP benefits, uh, what you ought to do is just get a whole host of people to descend upon the legislature or the legislators in their home districts uh, and let them know uh, how cruel uh, that bill is uh, and how absolutely unnecessary. It's not a penny of state money in mm -hmm. there. That is all federal funding coming back. Gives. $120 per kid uh, for the summer. That's it. For food. Uh, it, for food. And, uh, you know, I, I was sort of surprised that that bill came up. I, I didn't think Kansas would go down that route. I know some other states have gone down that route to, or, or the governor has just taken it upon him or herself to uh, say no. Uh, that actually happened in Nebraska. People made a huge stink, mm -hmm. uh, and the governor just changed his mind. So, I think you just need to make your voices heard uh, on behalf of, uh, of those folks. And then just work with, the, we actually have a lot of uh, things going on that I think you know, 
uh, address some of those food insecurity issues. I mean, we've got programs at the Department of Commerce that are and, and Department of Ag uh, that uh, will work with communities uh, to ensure that um, you know we're getting whatever we can resources into those communities for those folks. Uh, and then you know, as we go as we go along, I think there are other ways that we can work to ensure that, um, particularly our children, uh, are not going hungry. Uh, and I, I'd like to work with some legislators to, to see what we can do about that. A lot of other states have, have just gone to universal free, free lunch. lunch. Um, I think that's really something that we ought to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would eliminate a lot of hassle for schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and we make sure that our kids are getting getting fed. Thank you. Thank you. I think the governor has time for two more questions. So we'll take two more questions from the audience. Okay. Hello, I'm Ray Montgomery. I'm a second year poli sci student here. And I was just wondering, we talked a lot about um, the nationalization of local politics. How, as somebody running for like local politics, do you combat a nationalized campaign in a very polarized world? Well, I just did it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, particularly in my, in my last campaign, uh, you know, I was out there campaigning on schools and this, that, and the other thing. You know, and my opponent was you know, uh, campaigning on, on issues that really had no impact uh, on the state of Kansas and were really just, they weren't even issues in the nation. They were just conjured up issues, uh, you know, and then, you know, sold uh, to any willing candidate uh, to run on. So I think, um, you know, staying focused, uh, candidates have to stay very, very focused and, and on the issues that they know are a concern uh, to their constituents and not get distracted by you know, the, you know, hanging those culture war, you know, they're, they're only meant to be divisive. They're not meant to bring people together. So you just have to be very disciplined and not allow yourself uh, to get uh, distracted uh, by those things and just stay focused. And people will listen. I mean, it happened, but you know, I was not supposed to win either time actually, but certainly not, not the second time. You know, I, was, I was written off as dead in the water, uh, but uh, you know, we were able to pull that off. You know, it also takes, I mean, you've got to run a good campaign. You, you've got to raise a lot of money, you know, so you can get your message out, um, all of those kinds of things. But staying on message and, and not getting distracted um, and not taking it personally. Thank you so much. And our last question. Hi, Governor Kelly. Um, my name is Adam Moore, and I'm a public school teacher. So first, I wanted to say thank you for all you've done. Um, I have seen you speak once before in Lyons, Kansas. Um, and if you all don't know where Lyons is, <laughs> it's a very small town that they love people, but Democrats are maybe a different story a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I've always been so impressed with how you carry yourself and how calm, cool, and collected you are, even right now, just walking back and forth on the stage. Um, and as a speech and debate teacher, um, I know that my class isn't the most loved class on the planet, public speaking. Um, what would be your advice uh, for me and also my students um, to help them feel calm and not be completely freaked out at the prospect of speaking in front of others and making their voices heard? I think it's very normal to be freaked out. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, what you see today is not where I was 20 years ago when I first got into uh, politics and had to make uh, speeches, or, you know, or remarks at fundraisers or wherever. Trust me, uh, I, was, I was really bad at it. <laughs> Uh, so I would, I would say, you know, just do it. Practice, practice, practice. You know, in my line of work, I don't have any choice. I've got to go uh, do this stuff. So, uh, but by just continuing to do it, uh, you develop your own style. And, uh, and I think you ought to stick with it. I think you need to stick with, you know, uh, 
what works for you. You know, I'm not terribly bombastic, you know, whereas there are some speakers that, that are more like that, except at the State Fair, and then I'm very bombastic. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just a food fight. Uh, so, <laughs> at any rate, I think, I, think, I think it's just a matter of, uh, of doing it and, and putting yourself out there, uh, you know, and uh, working it through, and it will get better over time. You know, and if you've got some people to coach you and, and to help you with some things, uh, that's great. But I think even without that, uh, just doing it over and over and over again. Um, find out what works for you. You know, for instance, like I, you know, I can remember my first comms person wanted me to come out, you know, whenever I was doing remarks and, <coughs> you know, um, just maybe at most have some, some talking points. Uh, I'm good here. Uh, I don't, you know, that, uh, that's not something I'm really good at. Uh, I'm going to forget to say things I needed to do. So that's why I always present, almost always present, using um, pre-set uh, up remarks rather than just coming out and trying to wing it and hope I say what I'm supposed to say. Yeah. On the other hand, I wing it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, um, let's, again, provide our strong support and recognition for our governor, Laura Kelly.